Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar sh show where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be made available for you to watch later um, in our show archives for you to watch at your convenience. Uh, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of those show um, recordings. Both the live show and the um, archive recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the um, topics we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, similar to your state library perhaps. We provide training and resources and grants and databases to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find resources or shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, um, corrections, museums, archives, historical societies. <laughs> really, the only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries, uh, something cool libraries are doing. Um, something you think they could be doing. We have book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Um, we sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff come on the show uh, to talk about services and programs and things we're doing here through the commission, but we also bring on guest speakers and that's what we have with us today. Um, joining us this morning is uh, Pamela Shembri. Good morning, Pamela. Good morning, how Good morning. are you? And uh, she is, um, this is obsessed, she is from the Horace Greeley High School Library in Chappaqua, New York, my home state. I am a transplant from New York to Nebraska. <laughs> I've been here about 20 years, but originally from New York. And this is a session that uh, she did at the recent Computers and Libraries Conference in Washington, D.C. It was, uh, yeah, Arlington, right outside of it, yep. Yeah, near to Washington, D.C., yeah, East Coast. <laughs> Um, and I invited her to come on the show and sh um, share this with more um, people who are um, more librarians, because this is definitely something that not just students, I think, but anybody needs to be really Google aware of how when you were out there uh, searching things. Uh, so um, I'm just going to hand it over to you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, tell us all about how to do this. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for choosing to be here today, or if you're watching a recording of it, thanks for that as well. I am a librarian. I've been a librarian, a public school librarian for 33 years. So we just started summer here in New York. So this is our first full week. And uh, I hope that you have some nice summer plans. Uh, I have some coming up, so it should be nice. Um, I found this book as part of a collection that ALA puts out. It's called Outstanding Books for the College Bound. And in their 2019 which was delayed a few years, uh, selection of books. This algorithms of oppression was one of them under the science and technology section. Hmm. So as I read the book, I was horrified, fascinated. And I, I guess I knew underlying somewhere that everything is, uh, everything's got a dark side maybe. Yeah, this sort of showed me what the dark side of Google is. So. I want to say before I even start that I'm not being paid to do this by the author of the book. I did email the author. I said, what would you you know, like? I want to liaison this information to as many people as possible. But she's so she's just brilliant. Um, her name is Dr. Sophia Noble, and she's um, probably far too busy to even tell me. So um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this is her book. She you can you can hear her on some podcasts, um, different programs where she talks about the Google algorithm. I do want to say too that I had a uh, informal conference with my students, and we talked about this, but we also talked about AI. So I'm going to get into that at the very end. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. The purpose that Dr. Noble had when she wrote that book was to eliminate the social injustice and change the ways in which people are oppressed with the aid of allegedly neutral technologies. And that's what I always, you know, 
I want to believe <laughs> that they're neutral. But I'll tell you a little bit about me and why that comes to be. So I have two master's degrees. One was in library science. That was from 1992. And then about 10, 15 years ago, I decided to revamp my qualifications since the Encarta CD-ROM was the emerging technology when I got my degree. And I realized I was a little bit outdated. So I went and got another one in information systems and technology and then learned to code a little bit. And I can code pretty badly. I've also been a professional storyteller since um, library school. I didn't even know it was a job that people did since my father would just tell us stories around the table all the time. As people get paid to do that. And um, there was an assignment in library school and I did it. And ever since then, I've been telling stories as well. Um, so I, what I really like to do is teach the story behind the machine uh, to the students so they don't think it's just magic because it seems like it. I also have some really bad weaknesses that I do code very badly enough to get me in trouble like I don't know. And there's some limitations to my own experience. So as Dr. Noble wrote these pieces, this, this work, and I also had to translate, well, what have I experienced? And it's not the same experience that she had. I also up until recently was completely addicted to Google, like used it for everything. And just like everybody else, the verb Googled everything. Mm -hmm. I also have a little bit of hypersensitivity. I don't watch TV with commercials in it. I stream my music so I don't have to listen to, I don't let media come at me unfiltered. I choose to find my news. So I use it from very like bland sources like 1440, News 1440 or all, all sides. So uh, I also have my own personal bias. I feel like information wants to be free. So uh, I don't think everybody in the industry believes that otherwise we wouldn't have these exquisite databases, uh, which we do have. So when I run this and I do it as an interactive like slideshow, I would ask people, what is an auto suggestion or an autocomplete? And if you want, you can either put that into the chat and we can talk about it, or you can just sort of contemplate it. How do auto suggestions that come up on Google develop? Does anybody think about that? Good question. You know, I never have thought about it. I assume there's some sort of well, other people yeah, type into the question section if any of you all have any ideas or know how does this these auto suggested things work. Um, I'm sure we've all experienced them. You start typing something in and it finishes it. And um, sometimes it's what you were actually looking for. Sometimes it's a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Anybody have any thoughts on how you think those work? Um, I assume there's some sort of automated algorithm just counting up how many times somebody asked people ask something and then putting the most. Yeah, here we go. I'm just, I always thought it was uh, <laughs> the highest input of requests. Yeah. Yeah, sort of. And then what people click after they've actually started to input, like, um, it's based on, well, let's, let's get into that. This is how she began. They did this whole series. So for the UN, they were discovering that when they put into Google, women should or shouldn't, it came up with all of these horrible things about women's rights or women's place in the world. And mm -hmm. so this ad campaign, which is linked here, um, and that's just an article about the ad campaign. So at the end, when you get these slides, you can go back and look into it. It showed that in that search, there's inherent biases that are pointing people to think in the way that people before them have thought and then clicked and interacted with. So once that came out, it changed the way um, women's rights were perceived, which was step one, right? But Dr. Noble's work went deeper. So 
what's happening is that Google will present you search results. She's very blunt. I heard her in a podcast. She said, um, let's just face it. You know, Google is just one big advertising platform. And I thought, ooh, mm. in some way she's right. You know, um, they're not meant, Google wasn't put out there for education. It wasn't put out there for teachers to share how to get information with students. It was put out there so that people who want to buy a product can connect with people who sell that product. Mm -hmm. And the people who sell that product pay Google money to lift results and to put out their work. So <laughs> these things, this word relevancy, it's based on the algorithm that Google has developed. And you type in some search terms and then Google matches them to the sites that have the same words. And relevancy is partly determined by voting for a site. It's a popularity contest. If you click on it, that means you voted for it. And then within that site, voting in the backlinks, if your site has a lot of dead links that don't go anywhere, or if people can't link over to your site, your relevancy drops. Mm -hmm. But what is popular will rise to the top. There's a great video here. It's it's Maybe now it's about 12 years old, but Udi, I forget what his last name is, Mender, Mender, he was speaking with this person and telling them exactly how to use this, how this Google algorithm is. And he's like, people think that they're talking to a human, but you're not. You're talking to a machine. So it's not like you can just go, no, 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 not that one, not this one. You know, just immediately it's going to bring you what it thinks you want based on what everybody else before you had and what you're typing in. So in his example, he was talking about a food that he got at a restaurant and it had to do, there was seafood in it. And so he wanted to look up how to make this delicious dinner that he got at a restaurant. So when he went in, um, he remembered something about Newburgh. So he put in Newburgh and food. If you put Newburgh and food, Newburgh actually happens to be a prominent city. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Been there, yep. So now, yeah, <laughs> Newburgh, New York, absolutely. They do have some nice restaurants there, but yeah. <laughs> that's, that's not, not the thing that he wanted, right? So if he wanted recipe, he had to change his search terms to get recipe because Google's putting most of the time when people put a city and food, they're looking for a restaurant. So you have to change your search terms in order to get the recipe of seafood Newburgh. So that's. A seven minute video, which is so easy. It's like helps students so much and they go through it. You could pause it and let them try the activities. So those search results in Google, they evolve. It's not always going to be the same results. Um, they provide knowledge with these results they offer because they're influenced by the majority culture. So the more people click on that same type of pattern, the more embedded in strength those search terms have to connect you with the result that you are seeing however if it's the majority culture that rules in search engine results how do those in a minority group ever hope to influence or control the way they're represented in the search engine how can they climb to the top they're a minority, a majority mind works here. So they have to work extra hard to just get here. It's about money. So Dr. Noble talks about five themes in her book and it's Google's dominant narratives here. So Google does control their information and it does have some influence on what advertising companies are posing as information. And we as teaching librarians are really at the forefront of trying to help our students determine what's an ad and what's information. And with native branding and all these other problems that are now coming in, it's so much more difficult than when ads were on TV <laughs> and information was in books. So those two lines have been completely like, you know, that's antique, that's antique mindset. So in our growing mindset, we have to really think about the ways 
information is disguised. And then Google itself is going to prioritize their results based on promoting their own business interests over competitors. That's like just general basic corporate life, right? Be top and foremost, beat your competitors. They, especially when you're logged in to your Google account and you're searching, it's tracking you. So any click that you do, it, you're basically working for Google for free. <laughs> I wouldn't go to work without being paid. So I tend to not use um, both um, browsers that track me or, or um, I go on incognito so that there's not as much information tracked just on me. Although it's great when I want to put my socks in and it knows the kind of socks that I really like because I'm, you know, specific sock brand buyer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just uh -huh. don't need sometimes it. It's, like I said, sometimes it works great and then sometimes not at all. And all that tracking is something definitely to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. And then thinking about who's paying if you pay. So my daughter had a website when she was a kid because she was doing stuff for honeybees. And, you know, when we made the website, you have to put in the search terms that you want associated with your website. So if somebody put in colony collapse disorder, she mm -hmm. wanted that to bring them to her website. But we had to pay money in order to have that happen because there were a lot of other sites that were also using colony collapse disorder as a search term. So in order for her results to get up higher, we definitely had to pay. But if you have a lack of money, you can't pay, which means you can't get represented as well. The more money you get, the more chance you get of being represented. Um, Google will definitely promote their own products. So again, I stop and just sort of say like, how many Google products do you know of? What do you use? What are they? Make a short list. And you can do that. You can, I'll give you like a minute or so to maybe think of it. And then I will also show you how many I was thinking of or I saw on Wikipedia when I was doing this. There's Alphabet. <laughs> That's the Google parent company. Um, so what I would imagine is that you maybe use Google Maps and Google Search and Google Gmail, but Alphabet has now done drone technology, military grade robotics, fiber networks. Wow. And then Nest, Google Lens. Android is the largest operating system in the world. So. So here we are, if all of these were created by coders who don't understand minority perspectives, will they be created with embedded ideas in power? So when we think about who's working in the technology fields, mostly it's, I'm gonna say it's dominated by men. Mm -hmm. And think about minority group representation in the world of coding. I mean, she had an example, I think it was her, you don't see many 60 year old overweight white men working in coding as much as you don't see younger black females having enough representation in coding, right? It's mostly a group of younger men uh, drinking Soylent. No, I don't know what to say. There's just, <laughs> they're very interesting type of men who and that's mostly who it's dominated by but with encouragement you'll see other groups coming in and that's one of the themes that we're going to go into way back in 2011 the ftc kind of decided to look up and go oh yeah google is dominating the market oh, what what harm could this cause to consumers still not even thinking about educators or students mm -hmm. so then you know we talk about this search engine optimization uh, and what the advertisers pay for keywords and what those industries are that have money to pay and then who is using those search engine results so the impact on the educational system was not thought of much at all because big tech is putting in 
regardless of what we're thinking in education, big tech's not stopping for us. They're way ahead of us. And we have to catch up as educators. So when we get results, they're missing social context. And we have to be more aware of that as we're teaching in schools, students, things. So it's important. Google reinforces stereotypes. So when you write a research paper and you include citations, do you actually give weight to each of your citations? No, we don't give weight. We just list them at the end of a paper, right? But that's not how it works in Google. They're definitely giving weight to results. And this is what's a very difficult concept. It took a lot to even try to figure this out. Google has this algorithm and it creates rank. And that's their system of value. And it's created by all kinds of inputs. It's created by us clicking on the website, clicking back to another site, using strategic keywords and other things that they have called damping, like a damping factor. So if many pages point to a site or if a random surfer just visits it, it rises in ranks. If you pay for popular words, your rank rises. And yes, it is or it was more possible to manipulate results. There is a fun example she had where uh, some college kids decided to put their friend's name in in a Google search and every time there was a connection, they would put talentless hack and then click their um, friend's name. And so these two points came up over the course of a day until talentless hack and their friend was you know, excited. So that was like the number one result that you would get. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Mm. And they did it too with some presidents because people always have to poke a little fun at the government, but they've done it. Um, and yeah, that does work. But then at the end of the day, they'll they'll sort of flush it out and improve their results. And there's more explanations at the end. I have extra slides. So again, when you see this, you can look at that. So this is the easiest way for me to explain how she goes into her own personal narrative of what happened and why she became involved with this work. There were such offensive results. So if you can think of a time you were bullied, just come up with that name that you were called. And then before 2011, if you put that word in, it would automatically bring offensive results. Hmm. So yeah. So Sophia, who was the author, had a daughter and she was trying to find fun games for her daughter. And Sophia is black. And she asked Google, black girl fun, black girls fun, like just local in the area. She wanted to know what were fun things to do. Now, without any warning online, what came back were just very sexualized results and she was horrified. And you have to really think about that. If you're a black parent trying to find fun activities and you Google black girls, is that what you would have expected? Why didn't she even need the word porn mm -hmm. to be included in that search, right? Why is so, that the default? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And think about again what Google's reflecting majority culture. So we're going to try this. You can click your next tab open and do an image search on Google. You're going to do two different searches. You're going to do professor style and then you're going to do teacher style. And then when you're done, you can click in the chat. Any noticings, anything that. I, I definitely also look up librarian style. <laughs> always. Mm, that's Glasses, always. The bun yeah. and the, mm, yeah, it's so outdated. Mm. Oh yeah, I see the difference. Anybody in the uh, audience, uh, type in, what do you see between the difference between type of searching for professor style and teacher style? Yep. 
librarian and teacher are predominantly women and professor style is men. With the blazer wow. and the corduroy elbow patches <laughs> and the glasses, right? So page rank, that's what's coming up, the most popular image rank. It's revealing what other users clicked mm -hmm. before you. So what does that reveal about users? about society i have a bias everyone does everyone has a bias mm -hmm. yeah and their bias comes back to influence google so these also, search I the friends which i know isn't what you're going for but professor style is very dull and lots of browns and grays and teachers and librarians are much more colorful <laughs> they are <laughs> <laughs> much more fun and interesting looking than the professor ones <laughs> that's a brown this is one bias word. i would agree with <laughs> <laughs> i'll take that yeah but uh you know google's so it's just this big white screen like you can't see past it right there's just this results and like you know, what's behind there i don't know when the results come up, they're just normalized. Let's normalize this is believable. Kids who want an answer fast within 30 seconds are going to take the first things they see. Mm. And often it's just presented facts. This is just facts because it's coming up, but it's not. It's a symbiotic relationship. Google's informed by us and it's informing us. So it, mirrors society, which I'm not sure I like. <laughs> Code is made by humans, so there's going to be bias and there's going to be errors, and we have to confront this with education. So what can I do as a teacher? As an educator, I'm always trying to teach them better search terms. And it starts out like, you know, especially ninth graders, if you have to do the pros and cons paper, they always want to do, well, they used to want to do legalizing marijuana and then you know so i would say what are slang terms for marijuana they knew every slang term okay so then what's a more medical term that you would find for you know maybe a better way to present to get research results or legal results and they would have to come up with cannabis instead of like weed or mary jane or whatever they were saying same thing abortion termination these are just different terms of looking at it so we can say african-american girls and not black girls it'll give a different spin on it it's not fetished like fetishized so much as you're giving it a, a more educational legal less slang type of a term we always give these abc lessons this is me plugging for library lessons with teachers and students to vet all of your online sources. So the A in the briefest way, because again, I have high schoolers, I might only see them for 40 minutes in their entire high school time. Mm -hmm. Or I might see them for hours, but if I can only do one lesson, it's going to be the ABCs. So it's who's the author of the page? Can you actually find out who that author is? Are your facts accurate? Can you triangulate them? So that's the A's. The B is bias. What's the bias presented in this piece? And then C, where's the copyright? Who's holding it? And who's paying the cash to get that website up? And why? The cash for that site is the number one issue for me. Um, we can get into that again. So why are they paying for that site? And to critique social norms, teaching the ethics of information and who's paying for it, who's not why certain things are behind a paywall, uh, how did they get there? That's important as well. And then we're gonna get into another thing about challenging Google, which is the fifth theme. And also I'm always encouraging women and minority groups to code, learn how to code. Yeah, I don't wanna learn how to code. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't either after that PHP class that I had to take in my, my second degree, but. There are fun you ways to yeah, I follow the girls who code and black girls code. I, have a guy, I follow both of those uh, yeah. organizations, programs. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important to just support any kind of minority group because they can give a perspective when they're doing a user interface and results 
uh, showing back as to what's missing or what is offensive or what could still be added to help. Even though you don't understand the mechanisms, that I mean, you, it doesn't mean you can't see the faults. Like uh, Dr. Noble's great example was you can listen to song lyrics without understanding radio transmission. You can critique them. <laughs> so I don't really understand radio transmission. I know there's waves. That's about it. So that was a, I thought that was a good way to think about coding. Okay. She talks about in her next theme, other search engines. And so in the beginning, when I said, I don't use a browser, I use private search engines. And um, if I can, I'll use a specialized search engine. Uh, Pinterest for pictures isn't just all of Google. Like her thing is really like, get, get yourself away from Google when you can. So Zillow, if you just want housing, kayak for your travel. Because these are filled by web crawling and not submissions. So they're not like going out, they're like pulling from things that are listed and pulling, like they crawl and then pull in and it's a select uh, subset. So I do use DuckDuckGo. Uh, I haven't used Quant, but I did try it out. Uh, a lot of these aren't even available at my school because of the educational law. So, um, they have to know what the kids are on. It can't be private. Although the kids have their VPNs and they do probably, you know, work outside of that structure. And um, if you want to know more about the cookies that track us, how do they work, then you can check on this um, slide at the end again, if that's interesting to you. And her next theme was classify information and how we have done that as librarians in the past and how we're getting more modern and these days. So it took until 2016 for Dartmouth to ban illegal aliens as a library subject. Mm. Uh, <laughs> there's so many racially charged terms used in the Library of Congress regularly. Uh, they had classifications and misrepresentation. Um, and so when I explained to the kids why sometimes, even this was like maybe even four years ago, we would go into the, de uh, the database system and they couldn't find information if they were just asking like they used to ask in Google because the metadata was not the same. Librarians think in library subject headings and humans outside the library field think in regular common language. So for the kids, I'm like, well, if your hashtag doesn't match, you're not gonna find what all your friends are on, like what they're all looking at, right? So even if you take a hashtag and you butcher it up, like say you put in hashtag African-American humans are important. What are you really trying to say? You're really trying to say Black Lives Matter, but you've got the wrong hashtag. Get to the hashtag, right? Get to your match, your metadata, and you'll get your results that you really are seeking. So um, when you try to help students get to the right information, if you're still using older Library of Congress type of metadata, if the databases, which most of them have been updated now, um, they tried to do because of Google, the influence of Google. We actually had to evolve by studying Google searches, which is more user-friendly because Google was more influential than we were. So this was kind of fun. Uh, again, in that second degree, we had to do all kinds of classification exercises, knowing that metadata was becoming outdated in the way that librarians were using it, right? So for fun, you think of ways to categorize Abbey Road by the Beatles, right? How do the Library of Congress terms concur with popular terms and how are they different? So Library of Congress terms were totally different about like what we had to use in class to, we had to go on things like um, social tags, like last FM. So in last FM, it was the Beatles, which would be normal, right? Mm -hmm. Rock, classic rock, British, 60s, 1969, an album, a CD, just 
anything, Abbey Road even, just, you know. Mm -hmm. But in Library of Congress talk, man, English, 1960, 1970, rock music, rock music, England, rock music, England, 1961 to 1970, popular music, popular, like it did have the Beatles, but it was just a little bit less intuitive to younger users who are used to like really just getting online and getting to Abby none Road. of those are something an act a normal human being would actually type in to find <laughs> right right yeah. i mean the beatles yes they, they matched okay so that concurred uh, yeah check check for librarians yay and the rest are sort of like well you know <laughs> mm -hmm. hit or miss not the most easy way to find information. So we as librarians had have had an evolution of search terms in our field. It used to be women as accountants, like there's actually women as accountants, wow. But now it's just women accountants. This is not a big deal. Negroes changed to African-Americans. This was an actual subject headings. Gypsies. The C also term for gypsies, C also, rogues and vagabonds. Even if you look at our Dewey Decimal System, like 80% of it is just Christian. So that's a footnote in there, page 140 in her book. She talks about this evolution of search terms. Fascinating. It really is. So the indexing again, it's done by humans. We're bringing knowledge to the work. We are changing it. And what was once dominated by professionals, librarians, is now being shaped by members of society. So in order to stay relevant, we have to mix the two. And there's politics to it. If you can't find your hashtag, you can't connect to your information. And if you do connect, you're actually reflecting society and the society holds stereotypes. So her comment on what our profession has gone through is that unable and equipped to think through the complexities of systems of racialization, the profession at large struggles to find frameworks to think critically about the long-term consequences of misidentification of people. And in this case, concepts about work, works of art. So they had it an image on art store and the metadata that was going on for art stores image and so you could check that out that's a whole nother conversation if i get into that we tend not to finish so <laughs> this is where things come into play um for you as a person if you want to fight back and sort of, of regulate so uh our opinion does count unfortunately tech companies are not government agencies although they're starting to act like they are um there are a lot of lawsuits social media and political influence going back and forth the elections and what they had as influence um and they're holding corporations trying to hold corporations responsible and those individuals mark zuckerberg well your platform facebook allowed these hackers to come in and create misinformation, which influenced the election. So knowledge is really the key to start implementing change. Mm -hmm. Google will respond to your issues, okay? They didn't, they didn't for a long time. So people would say, hey, I'm getting offensive results for black girls. Uh, they'd be like, well, you know, I don't know what to say. That's just, you know, based on the platform, we can't do anything. And this went on, uh, maybe the groups, um, LGBTQ groups were putting up, okay, this is offensive. Oh, sorry, I can't, you know, do anything. Well, then Jewish people, said when we put the word Jew in, all we do is find anti-Semitic results. And there's even Holocaust denial and neo-Nazi pages. Mm -hmm. Google tried to do the, oh, you know, why don't you just try to put in Jewish people or put Jews, not just Jew. Google said, we can't do anything about the words like co-opted thing with white supremacists. We don't, we're not responsible for that. 
<laughs> I said, try a little harder. And it's not, it's not our fault. We're not responsible. Hmm. Yeah, we're not responsible. And there's links to the articles about this. And by 2016, things started to change. So now you'll see different results. And Google will now continue to change their algorithm two to three times a day on average. Hmm. So how do you report to Google? You can use a link that is in this presentation to give feedback. It's right from Google about your search results. And if you need legal help, you can begin with another link that I've embedded. And there's a video here to show you how they uh, improve their search engine, their search algorithm. So you can see how it brought it down. The top reasons why the Holocaust didn't happen. That's right now it's expunged. All of this did the Holocaust happen is expunged. Google makes changes. The results are no longer in the denial in denial over the Holocaust. So this is all work that has happened since in the last 10 years or so. Here's an infamous site I used to use um, for the students, which is exactly why I ask them to find out who is hosting a site, who's putting the money into a site. Mm -hmm. If you typed it to Google, um, Martin Luther King Jr., just that, it would come up with a site that was called The True Historical Examination of Martin Luther King. And it was this site. And you can see it's very 1990s. It's terrible oh, wow. interface. <laughs> Yeah. And oh, it had yeah, and it had different parts that we checked and we triangulated and maybe like there was one piece of information that came from Wikipedia, but it was so biased that when you went on, you you couldn't figure out why this would even be on, but think of a sixth grader doing their report and having this come up as a result, the top 5 results. And when you come down here, it says it doesn't even have like you know, a copyright date and it doesn't have authors. So it doesn't pass like most of the ABCs, right? So then you come down here and join MLK discussion forum hosted by Stormfront. Hmm. Stormfront is a neo-Nazi group and it put the money into this ad to have it up. And then when you clicked on that, you would get taken right to the forums of Stormfront where there was incredibly hateful language going on about everything in the world. So it wasn't even like hidden. It was just, you would get linked right there. You didn't need a password to get in anything. You would just be exposed to all of it. So it took a long time, but this site is no longer online. Uh, sites have been removed, altered, pushed down in rank due to public exposure. So your voice is important. You can make an impact, make a difference. That's it's good to have an actual you know example of yes, it does matter when you do bring these things to their attention or or yeah. Absolutely. Yep. It makes you feel at least like you know. I'm logging it in. I can get all my students to log it in and just say, this is not right. And now my students do it even more than ever. Oh, look at what I found on this site or whatever. So, okay. I said I would bring up some interesting things about AI. Now, AI, our students are no longer even using Google for the first steps. They said, why would we go to Google and then have to look through all those sites when we could just ask AI? And then it gives us the information then we go back to Google to check to see if what they gave us is verified. And I thought that's an interesting strategy, but it makes sense. But what's AI? AI is really just scraping the internet, but generative is also creating more information based on context and relationships. So it's even more important now if we're not finding the results that seem more neutral or are incredibly biased to mm. report. So this one I'm in the middle of right now, Unmasking AI, where this young coder, as she was, oh, Joy, she, she was in college at the time, she was at MIT, she was doing facial recognition, but she had this mask. They couldn't even recognize her black face at all. It was indistinguished. And then she put the white mask on it and it was able to see her. She thought, this is terrifying. It can't even see us. It's ridiculous. Um, race after technology is very similar to the themes of how minority cultures without money are disregarded and how it actually 
um, with all the stereotyping targets people for like homelessness or whether they should have benefits like food stamps or, you know, just whether they're going to be able to get a job. So it's just the accumulation of what technology has spit back out. And I haven't started this one yet. It's just like, just opened the pages, so I can't really talk about it, but that's what I'm into next. I did just also read a book called Our Next Reality, and Lewis Rosenberg spoke on this and talked about how the cell phone probably won't even be the tool. Like, we're not meant to experience the world by looking at a screen. We're meant to experience it by being in it, and how this would probably be just gone, and you'll have glasses on that are AI-enhanced, and you'll be moving through your life and you could get into the metas, you can metaverse, you know, and, and interact with your AI and different realities. But also by having these glasses on, it's sort of specific to you and your data and your likes and dislikes. So if you're walking down the street and it knows that you are interested in getting a new car, uh, it would put a car up, a vision of a car on the street that you were thinking about. Only you would see it. Your friend next to you, their glasses don't show that car. And then it would sort of be an advertisement. And you might have a hard time even distinguishing when you're getting human input or conversational AI input. That's where that's going. Mm -hmm fascinating so that was called our next reality and that i mean it's all leading back to the same bits of code the same data that we're entering the same information all this information is coming from stuff we've clicked on we've typed all of our posts on reddit or facebook it's learning from that and it's going to adjust and give you information back Dr. Noble said, it's of no collective social benefit to organize information resources on the web through processes that solidify inequality and marginalization. And that's just on the web. <laughs> it's, not, it's not AI. <laughs> it's just sort of on the web, but sort of in our laws. But yeah, that's the conclusion of her presentation in her book. And I thought it was really important. So I've been trying to share that with people. Uh, when I do this with students, I do ask, it's one thing you learn that you might tell a person who didn't attend and is there anything you wanna know more about? So I think we still have like, we're at 11.50, well, 10.50. Mm -hmm. We have that kind of time. And there's mm -hmm. also all of these, um, these are all different slides that are in the back, explaining rank if you wanted to and um, mm -hmm. videos to help more, so. Oops, am I in the wrong? Yep. So anyway, um, these are yeah. these are the slow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, yeah. Yes. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Anything? Um, like like your, your those two questions you had on there. Um, anything you learned that you would want to share with people, or anything you wanted to add, know more about, or ask more about, or share with any experiences you've all had with dealing with Google and become, being aware of how it actually works. Uh, type into the questions section. We do have a little, yes, about 10 minutes left for any questions or discussion anyone has. Um, there's definitely a lot of eye-opening um, information in here, uh, um, Pamela, of course. Um, some things I It'll knew, that things I was aware about and concerned about, uh, some things I did not. There's always, like I said, there's always, able, always something new uh, to learn. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, someone wants to say they're already texting my friends about the teacher versus professor Google image exercise. <laughs> so get those corduroy pockets on. <laughs> like, I was just like, wow. like a New England professor, too. Not even like, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because professors in like California or, you know, they don't count. Former states aren't going to be wearing those corduroy jackets with all that. <laughs> Stanford's not even that good of a school. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's one thing. Yeah, doing that search about comparing just to 
something you wouldn't even think about, professor, teacher. Um, okay, let's see here. We got things coming in. Uh, someone says, um, I've always known to follow the money in terms of resources. Um, but I don't think my brain connected that to a simple Google search. I think I only viewed that as an academic need before this. So yeah, anything you're doing, um, your own personal research doesn't even have to be. I mean, you were focusing on the fact that you know people in education need to be aware of this when you're teaching and teach to your students and explain it. But um, just for us doing our own general searching too, dig critical thinking, dig into these websites and these results you find to see where they're really coming from, because sometimes they are um honest and open about who they are and sometimes they are not <laughs> true and the view to be aware that don't believe everything that you the first things you come up with um and it says yeah. thank you for the check of my bias and updating of my thinking yeah <laughs> um i had an experience so when i was in when i worked at a university library helping someone and this was just on our in our catalog on our online catalog um <clears throat> looking for books and topics you explain what our topic was and search results came up and they weren't exactly right so i knew we were gonna have to go in and do a little dig dig a little deeper and re reframe the search because okay this isn't exactly what you were talking about so let's you know look more past these first you know results that came up and she said nope i'll just take the first one because didn't mm -hmm. have the, was just too lazy didn't have the time didn't think and i'm like but no, that's not what your paper's about that you need to work on. I'm just gonna take the first one on the list. Well, good luck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that, that's not right. Enough. I tried, I tried to stop from her, but just adamant and just no, I just want to get this one and leave. I'm like, fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not gonna get a good it's... grade. But it, and it was it's just so hard as a librarian as us to try and because you mentioned that too, don't just take the first things that come up just because they come up. It's gonna. It, Google is not is what you said an instant gratification type thing unless you get lucky, and more often right. than not, you do have to go beyond just your first impulse of whatever came up in your first search. Yeah, especially because in education you're not planning on buying things. You know, that's not your goal. Mm. And even when things i mean we have a great example too about how uh you can see a bunch of kids sitting around at a table at a library and there's three cell phones they're going to do the cell phone challenge and they all put their cell phones on and they make them ring so they're calling out there's three of them and there's three or four kernels of unpopped corn on the table and they start to ring, ring. i think i might even have it linked ring right so it's on they're watching and guess what happens to the uncooked popcorn? It pops, <laughs> supposedly, because of this cell phone radiation making it oh. pop, right? <laughs> so the kids are like, wow. I said, okay, I'm gonna tell you, that is not factual at all. And who sponsored this video that you're watching right now? So they have to look and they have to look and they have to look. So if you had to guess who's sponsoring a video that makes people think that cell phones have enough radiation to pop 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 popcorn. yeah it's people who sell these things that keep the phone out of your ears right people who sell bluetooth earbuds they were the ones that created this fake video which looks totally real it's awesome mm -hmm. you're like well i bet you that could happen absolutely not and like that's when the kids start to go oh wow it's that deep yeah it's that deep mm -hmm. that was an advertisement that was not just oh that's kind of fun it's getting you to buy something it's and creating. it goes back to the money again mm -hmm. yeah. yeah always <clears throat> oftentimes always goes back to the money very often yeah mm -hmm. all right and then we just got some thanks coming in great information um and a question, okay. yes, um, about the slides, yes, and because you have mentioned uh, when we have the recording put up, which I should have um, by the end of the day today, um, the recording and the slides will be available to everyone. Um, you know, uh, Pamela is going to send me a link, a uh, link to her Google Slides here, and so you will have access to all this. So if you notice, there were um, links within um, videos and, and other resources in there. Um, you'll all have um, 
access to all of that with the on the archive page. If any of the links are not opening for you, like, oh, you need permission, just click it and I'll open it. I don't, you know, some are on my server right here, my hard drive, others are in the cloud, but we'll get them opened. Yeah. All right, any other last minute desperate questions or comments that anyone wants to share, type into the question section. Um, and yeah, Pamela, send me, when we're done here, after we wrap up, you can send me the sharing link to your Google Slides. I'm gonna okay. pull presenter, well, wait, I'm gonna keep an eye on the questions. I'm just gonna pull presenter control back to my screen to do my little wrap up for the show. But um, if you have any questions, anything you wanna ask, anything you wanna talk about, go ahead and type it in. We have, we um, will, I'll make sure we address everyone's questions. So, um, but thank you everyone for joining us. Um, got a lot of people here today, it's great. I'm so glad we're getting this information out to people. Uh, beyond the conference that you presented at originally, this this Thanks. presentation, uh, and hopefully we'll have more people uh, uh, picking up on this. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, all right. So that is, uh, yeah. So here is our Encompass Life. And if you do use your <laughs> search engine of choice, we don't sell anything here except for, for, you know, like I said, information must be free of commission. But if you do use whatever your search engine of choice is and type in Encompass Live, you uh, will come up with both our main page here for the show, with our upcoming shows, and our archive page right here beneath, underneath here is archives. And this is where we post our recordings. There is, depending on the session, let's see if this one has it, yeah, um, a link to the recording, which is um, going to be up on the Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube channel. And then in our case, we will have a link to the Google Slides um, that Pamela is using today. So yes, you'll have access to both the recording and the slides um, when this is done. Uh, when everything is processed, which like I said, I want to get done by the end of the day today, uh, tomorrow being the 4th of July, um, we're closed uh, as a federal holiday, and then I'm off on Friday. So I want to get this recording up for all of you before the end of the day today. So um, everyone who attended this show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting me you know when the recording's ready. Um, but we also push it out on, we have mailing lists here within Nebraska. We also push it out on our social media. If you notice, we have a Facebook page um, here for Encompass Live. If you like to use Facebook, you can give us a like there. Um, you see we post reminders about here, log in today's show. Um, here's information about the previous show and then when the recordings are available. Um, we use a hashtag Encump Live on Twitter and Instagram as well sometimes. So you can search for that um, elsewhere as well if you want to keep an eye on what's uh, going on on the show. Uh, while I'm here on the archive page, we do have a search feature. If you want to search and see if we've done a show on any topic of anything that you're interested in, you can do that. Search our sh full show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want something very current. Um, and that is because I'm going to scroll down a bit here, but not all the way. If you look over here in the scroll bar, you can see this is a very large page because this is our show archives going all the way back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was January 2009. So we're at 16 years. We're in our 16th year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we That's do great. have every single show recording up here on our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you are watching an old show, just pay attention to the original broadcast date. Everything has a date, um, so you can know when it actually went was done live. Uh, some of the shows are great, will um, stand the test of time, still be good, useful information, but things will become old and outdated. Uh, resources may change drastically, links may be broken. Uh, people may work at a different institution than when they presented for us 10 years ago or something. So just be aware of the date when you are actually watching any of our old shows. Uh, but this is something that libraries do keep things for historical purposes. And as long as we have a place to host and um, to have all of our recordings out there, um, which right now is, like as I said, our YouTube channel, we will always keep them up and available. Um, and here's my search. If you want to see my professor's, professor style search, <laughs> lots of men. I did some women pop up, but lots of those grays and browns and dark colors and then very colorful all female teachers and then librarians, a little mixture of it, yeah. But yes, also trending towards female as well. Absolutely. 
All right. So I don't see any other desperate questions coming in, but just more thanks. Thanks for the information. Uh, good resources. Um, and whoops. Thanks. Go back here. Um, all right. So uh, as you can see so far, I do not have a show uh, book for next week yet. Um, it will we might be taking that week off. I'm just waiting to hear back from someone. Um, so keep an eye on our um, page here to see if we do get a show or just we just take a week off. We do that every now and then. Um, but here's some of our upcoming shows. Um, if the other dates will be getting filled in as well um, as I go back and forth with people to get them on the show. Um, but two weeks from now, we do have Think Outside the Box, uh, transformative training with breakout challenges. Um, here in Nebraska, we have regional library systems and um, Tammy Thiem, who's one of our uh, directors, um, using breakout boxes, which you may have used with students um, sometimes, those educational you know, breakout EDU. She's using them with um, in public libraries to do training for library boards. It's very interesting. Um, so if you wanted to learn more about how to do that. Um, and then at the end of the month, we always have, and we'll see, you know, what sure the topic is this year, this month, um, the last Wednesday of the month is always our pretty sweet tech sessions. Um, our technology innovation librarian, Amanda Sweet, comes on the show. So always the last Wednesday of the month, you can depend on it being something techy related. Um, so if you're into tech, uh, sign up for that. Uh, I'm going to reach out to her soon and see what she has on uh, deck for uh, this month. All right, I think that wraps up for today. Thank you so much, Pamela. So glad to get you on the show. Thank you. Um, it's really nice. Uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, one good information, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be referring to this one in uh, in the future. Um, Great. And I'll wrap up today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pamela, and hope to see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye bye. Bye.